Thank you so much. God bless you. God increase you. Open doors for you. Help you to see, to understand, to hear, to do the most needful things. To be strong and powerful. Compelling and clear. In the name of Jesus. Please put your hands together for the Lord. You may take your seats. God bless you all real good. I'm excited to be here, honestly. Um, Pastor Tyro is my friend. You know, I love him. I respect him. I honor him. I don't take our relationship for granted since the first day we met at the University of Ibadan. The journey that I have worked, I've seen 10 years, five times with some extras. So you have an idea of how old I am. 10 years, five times. That's already 50. So you got some extras all around that. Um, my work has helped me to go around the world, and I, as I still do, I meet people every day. Before I say what I want to say, let me say that the last time I flattered someone that I attempted to say what is not entirely true about someone, like telling somebody you, you look nice when you don't, or to tell somebody you, you, you are well-dressed when you are not. The last time I did that was 1997, to be honest. Since then, by a particular experience, I have vowed that for the rest of my life, the truth of my conscience will be the judge of the things that I say or don't say. So I'm the guy that um, if you are not looking well, I'm going to tell you. I will hug you, but I'll tell you you, you are not looking well. If you didn't brush well, I'm going to hug you, I'll tell you. If you have a body odor, I will hug you tighter so that you know I'm not afraid of your odor. But I will tell you, you are not smelling well. These are things you can live a thousand years and nobody will tell you. I made up my mind I will be that guy who will tell you. Right? Somebody came to me and said, you know, he wants to start, she wants to start a business. She's been head of HR in the company for years. Da, 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 da. I asked her two questions in less than 15 minutes. I told her, the seed of starting business is not in you. I don't know who is encouraging you. I don't know who is supporting you. But you can't start a business. You're an Aaron. If you're an Aaron, you are called to a Moses. If you're a Moses, you are called to the people. You have to be humble to know the one you are. None is superior. It's about role playing. And when you are smart, you humble yourself to stick to design, right? I've met so many people, their lives were fine until they started business. You know, there are so many pastors today who are supposed to be teachers, evangelists, prophets, apostles. You don't find those ministries in Nigeria because the only way people interpret ability to preach is to start a church. And ability to preach is not proof of pastoring. And there are so many pastors who should be teachers, evangelists, prophets, apostles, functioning without grace in the office of a pastor and creating stress in the body. Associates who should be humble, standing by a Moses, moved by their economics. Because they can't see how a teacher will be rewarded if he's not collecting tithe and offering. They can't see it in their ignorance. So they go and start a church. One of the biggest problems we have in the body of Christ, particularly in this part of the world, is associates who insist on pastoring and starting a church. And they don't know. They wrestle, they gossip, they do all kinds of things, navigating their way to the pulpit. They've messed up churches, crashed headquarters, just because they insist on their past. May God give us understanding. But the greatest grace you can know in your life is one scripture. One of the greatest graces you can know. Let every man abide it where he is called and there with God. Amen. Um, so what I'm saying now, I don't have to say. You know when you come to a church on Sunday morning, you must say nice things about the pastor. You must say nothing about first lady. Say nothing about the leader. Even if they are not true, just say it. That's protocol of ministry. 
So the, the temptation now is, you would think that's what I'm doing. You would think maybe I'm just trying to say nice things about pastor. It's okay. If you think so, it's fair. Because that's what people do. But that's because you don't know me. If you know me and you have followed my work, the same some of my videos on YouTube, I've gone to churches where as they introduce me like this, I just pray and start teaching. I won't say a word. That is my gift to the ministry. My silence. Because if I have to say something about a pastor, that would be a problem. That can be the end of that church in that mode that they, they know them. So, to be honest, I just keep quiet and teach and do the work of the Lord and get out. Because what I have to say is crisis. So, um, I don't, I, I'm free born. Born free will die free. I wake up every morning dancing to the audience of one. And that's my maker. I don't try to be liked. I don't try to be favored. I don't care. You know, uh, I try to be respected. And that comes from the habitual application of principles. It's as simple as that. You don't have to like me, but you respect me. Yeah. Right? So, um, I hold no man nothing. So, I don't have to say anything nice about anybody. There's nobody in the world that requires that level of pretense from me. God sees me as I am. Sees all my weaknesses, all my foolishness. And he has not killed me. That has freed me from acting in front of every man. Since I can't act in front of God, I can't act. He sees me as I am. There's no point. I don't care what you struggle with. God sees it. If God can see it, trust me, any human being can see it. It's fine. They will be okay. They can talk. They can do it. The lifespan of bad news is 90 days. Just that you don't know. Every time you say something about it, you elongate that 90 days. If you can just keep quiet, something will come. Big brother will start. He will forget about you. Nobody is that important. You understand what I'm saying? I'm telling you. It's just because you don't know. That's why you worry about men. Men have such a short memory. If you can just do your job and face your crisis and stay under God, everything will be all right. You see what I'm saying? So I said all of that to say what I want to say now. I really, really respect this man of God. I really honor him. I celebrate him. He's my friend. Woman of God, I love you. I love your family. God bless you for your love, for all that you do. I cherish God's chambers. I cherish it. Right? So, um, from the bottom of my heart, this is a perfect place to be. I congratulate you for being in this church. Congratulate yourself. Be glad you are in a perfect place. You have two great leaders. You have amazing people. Right? The only advice I have for you is, don't warm the pews. Find something you can do here. This is the perfect place to be involved. Don't just come and go. Join the workforce. If there's no department for you, write a proposal, send it to pastor and say, we can do this. I can start this department or we can lead this. But don't just come and be an onlooker. Find something to do. The movements we are leading here is amazing. It's metamorphosizing, evolving very quickly. Before you know what is happening, it will be so, so large, so compelling and penetrative, you won't even believe you watch all of that happen without your contribution. So get involved, uh, support the work, ask what you can do. God will bless you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I came here with very good people, um, my assistants and my friends. Um, Sheikh Mwakwade, can you just let them see you again? And I have Agose also here. We let them see you. Okay. Right? And my son is somewhere having a great time. Right? Um, Pastor, Pastor and Mrs. Um, Obisha, so thank you for coming. You decided to spend time with us today. I honor you, sir, and ma. Thank you for your kindness. Um, all protocols observed. Leaders in the house, God bless you. Pastors who came to be here this morning. God honor you. Choir, you know, you bless me. Such a short time, you really bless me. Thank you for what you do. Okay, um, I want you to really open your mind. You know, this is a well-taught church, so I'm just going to be building on what pastor has been teaching you. I may say some things that you think you know the meaning, but don't judge. Just calm down. Let me land. Everything I'm saying is in line with what God is saying here. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
So don't be quick to say, ah, what's that? What's that? Uh, if, if that's what you came to look for, you will see many in my messages. <laughs> but if you are here for truth and you want God to lead you into newness, then open your mind. Don't judge. Just ask God to teach you today. Everything I say is not for you. There's no way everything I'm saying is for everybody. So your own may be one sentence, but be alert to pick it when it comes. Yours may be the whole thing. I don't know. And quite frankly, it's not my worry. But I need you to stay open and let God. My job is to teach. It's called responsibility learning. What happens to you after that is your own job. Mm. Amen? Amen? I'm never responsible. Somebody said, ah, we went somewhere. You know, we need to help the people. I said, I don't do such help. First of all, I'm not a pastor, as you can see. You have a congregation. I don't have to, you know, you don't know what I endure when I go to churches. You know, I went to a church for three days where I was, after the administration, the pastor wanted me to counsel some people, counsel, counsel. Man, there's a lady that came for counseling. I wanted to tell her, Madam, you need to shut up, honestly. <laughs> just shut up and get out of this room. You are just saying nonsense all day. What's this? But it's the work of God. I have to endure it. I to endure it. You know, you know, one, one woman, one guy came to me one time in a church, you know, was talking about the things he wanted to do. He wants to have the private jet, he wants to do this. So I said, sorry, please, ask me, do you have a card now? He said, no. Excuse me, why are you bothering me with all these things you are saying? You are really disturbing me. That one I told him. You are disturbing me. I mean, if you want to dream, dream, dreaming is free. You don't have to come here and be dreaming in my own ears. Because everything you are saying is not practical. You can be dreaming in your bedroom. I don't have a problem with it. But not on the counseling table. I need to end this conversation now. That is a true life story. You know, I'm not a nice guy, honestly. You just don't know. I'm not a nice guy. I don't try to be nice, you know. Because when you want to be nice, eh, you want people to like you. You will say yes when you should say no. You will say no when you should say yes. You will frown when you should smile. You will smile when you should frown. Because you are busy trying to be in people's good books. I'm already in the book of life. Who, who are you? I mean, I can't, I don't need to stress to be in your book. You know? So, I don't do that. Instead of trying to be liked, strive to be respected. They don't have to like you. You can fail the test of popularity and pass that of essence. You can. That's why I celebrate pastors a lot. Put your hands together for pastors. Because I can't do what they do. The way I knew I can't pastor is through counseling. I don't have the patience. I've walked somebody out of my office before. I, said, I don't know how you got here, but somehow you beat my protocol, but you won't continue like this. You are going to stand up now and get out. I'm sorry. I'm, I, God bless you. God increase you. If I've done anything wrong, may God have mercy on me, but you will go. You are going now. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a clap offering. Come on. The most difficult job in the world is the job of a pastor. Tough. Tough the job of a CEO. A CEO is paid for how much foolishness he can eliminate around him. He must hire right, get everything right. So they pay him for eliminating foolishness. A pastor is paid for inspiring it. You don't understand. The fool, the stupid, everybody come. He manage everybody. He must manage them. Otherwise, God won't pay. That's a tough job, man. So when I looked at all those, I said, I don't know what I will be, but this pastor, I can't do it. And if you follow my work, it's not because I can't preach. I've read the Bible over 40 times. Genesis to Revelation. I know what's there. I can teach. But ability to teach is not proof of pastoring. Pastoring is a special grace. It comes with a temperament, patience, understanding, inspiration, motivation, so many things that I am not. And so many things that I am are not built for pastoring. I'm an apostle, I'm a teacher, I'm a prophet, I'm an evangelist, but that pastor. So when you have a pastor in the house, they are angels. You should love them, celebrate them. I don't take them for granted. Right? I'm an associate pastor till the day I die. In the Fountain of Life Church, I serve with my senior pastor, Father Taiwo Dukoya, globally. But I'm also focused on my own work, where I'm the Moses. 
and that work is no church. Amen. Amen. Woo, have you heard me? Yes, Open your Bibles very quickly. We're going to read some scriptures and I'm going to start talking. Today I will take some extra time. Hmm? I'm not coming back next Sunday. <laughs> I'm not coming back for a while. And I've not been back for a while. So I really can't. The time says 34 minutes. I already know I will beat it. <laughs> so, you know, Pastor will endure. God will give him grace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And then God will give you all grace. Amen. I'm not going to be worried about you because you are seated. <laughs> I am standing. I'm managing a back situation. I'm in a worse situation. So I can't pity you and ignore myself. I have to pity myself first. If I'm going to stand, you should be gummed with a bow stick on your chair. Super glue. Get the idea? Do you love me? Yes. At times I'm in crisis. I know, but it's okay. Um, but it will be worth every second of it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Today there will be shifts Amen. from point A to point B. Amen. Whatever those points are for you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Open your Bibles very quickly to um, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Sorry, chapter 6 from verse 3. If a man begets a hundred children and lives many years, he begets a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul has not seen meaning. One translation says, his soul has not seen goodness, or indeed he has no burial. I say that a stillborn child is better than he. A stillborn child. For that stillborn child comes in vanity, departs in darkness, and its name is covered with darkness. Though it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet this has more rest than that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice, but has not seen meaning, that stillborn child is still better. Amen? Let's rush to... The same Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I'm reading from verse Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 2. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 2. Uh, is it on the wall already? Therefore, I praise the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still alive. I praise, I praise the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still alive. One translation says, I congratulate the dead who are already dead more than those who are alive. Yes, I congratulated and thought more fortunate are those who are already dead than the living who are still alive. Next verse. But better off than either of them, better than the one who is dead and the one who is alive, is the one who has not been born, who is yet to be born, who has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. So there are three people here that I, there are, there are three existences here. There is the existence that is yet to be born, there is existence that is born, and there is existence that is born and dead. Are we together? Yes, sir. So let's go to Jeremiah in chapter 1. Jeremiah in chapter 1. Jeremiah 1 real quick. Jeremiah 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of blah, blah, blah. Verse 2. Blam. Verse 3. It came to Jeremiah also in the days of Je Jehoquam, the son of king of Judah, until blam, blam, blam. Verse 4. Five. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. 
and approved of you as my chosen instrument before you entered the womb. Before you got into the womb, you had an identity. You had an existence. And before you were born, I consecrated you. It didn't happen after you were born. I consecrated you to myself as my own. I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Right? Let's read very quickly Hebrews in chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Hebrews in chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Therefore, since these, his children, share in flesh and blood the physical nature of mankind, he himself in a similar manner also shared in the same physical nature but without sin. So that through experiencing death, he might make powerless, ineffective, impotent him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Let's go. And that he might free, everybody says free. free. He might free all those who through the hunting, fear of death, were held in slavery throughout their lives. Because of the fear of death, they were in slavery throughout their life. One translation says, those who, because of the fear of death, were in bondage all through their life. So you can't be afraid of death and complete your destiny. No matter how hard you try, you will live a suboptimal one. You will be okay, you will be around, you will be like, you will be around but not present. You will be doing something, you are waking in the dark, you are dissipating energy, but the very script that you are appointed for in Jeremiah 1, you might never achieve. The fear of death cannot lead you into meaning and purpose. And I'm going to be speaking to all of that today. There are some other scriptures I need to read. Ephesians 3.20, I'll get it when I'm, when I'm ready. Uh, Matthew in chapter 6, um, I'll read it when I'm, when I'm ready. And then Genesis 11, I'll read that when I'm ready. So Jesus, this moment is yours. Use it to your glory. Thank you for all that you do. You are not going to challenge us today. You don't challenge anyone. You are just going to change us and make us better, Amen. and take us to a new level, Amen. new vistas, new frontiers, Amen. new understanding, Amen. new strength, new influence, Amen. new authority, Amen. by grace and by your power. Amen. We thank you for precision in the spirit, Amen. clarity more than ever before, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for the integrity of your word. Amen. You sent your word, it heals, yes. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, as you journey through life, a lot of the experiences you are going to have are not authentic. They are experiences curated by human beings. And human beings don't do things just for doing sake. Powerful human beings do things with an agenda. Anything created by a human being has a script in it. He has an agenda, end to end. There's something he wants to achieve that compelled him to start that process. If you go to school and you have a master's degree, BSc, PhD, the more academically qualified you are, the lesser of yourself you might know. The most classroom you sit in, the more endangered your authenticity becomes. By that, we are not saying don't go to school, but the person who invented the curriculum has an outcome he wants you to demonstrate. Mm. You are not just going to school, you are going into somebody's program. Hey. And by the time you are done, when they say you have graduated, it means you have become the intention of some people. Hey. Now that intention, God help you if it is not the intention of your creator. Hmm. Definitely it is not. Hmm. So here you are, academics cannot define your meaning. Academic is what you are taught. Education is what you teach yourself. Revelation is what God has revealed to you. Now you can live all your life within the realm of academics, which is small compared to God's design for you. Right? And so a rebellion has to live inside of you that is not rude, that is not disrespectful, but that is strong enough, potent enough to compartmentalize what you are learning and creating a division that stresses what is needed in your journey and what is not needed. 
There are so many things human beings are going to teach you that are not needed for your journey. Or they are needed by them to arrest your journey and superimpose their own agenda as a virus in your journey. Now, once you don't understand that, you will achieve a lot. You will be confidently ignorant. Because what is running your life is different from what you understand. And you will come out into the public to harass smaller fools with the little nonsense that you have been able to put together. That really, frankly, passes the test of locality, maybe fails the test of universality. And maybe it passes the test of universality, but fails the test of your design and your essence. Because you are born for something. And trying to have billions of naira does not mean you are achieving purpose. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. And life can be that aggressive on you. So your life is not going to be complete because you have cars, you have houses. That's not why God is in your life. Whatever fooled you into that kind of mentality where you are going to assess and rate the faithfulness of God in your life by the acquisition, acquirings of your life, Oh my God, you are so small, you are not even aware. A car is not a testimony. A car is a tool of effectiveness, efficiency, and speed. When you come to church to share testimony that you bought a car, it's weakening. It's almost depressing to witness. Because there are people out there who don't go to church, who don't do prayer of agreement. At least the brand, if you, they don't lay hands in Toyota. They don't, they don't do prayer of agreement at Mercedes-Benz. They don't do vigil at BMW. So the people who made the car that you are testifying about don't care about your God. You then buy what they have made in the name of your God. And your God has not moved you to make one. Now you are going to work so hard to gather money to go and pay those people. And they need your money to do whatever it is they want to do. Sin doesn't grow because it's just there and sweet. Look, anything can be sweet. Is who is packaging it. The idea is that sin grows because those who spend money funding sin spend more money than those who fund righteousness. It's really as simple as that. There are more sinners with capacity than Christians with capacity. And you can debate that all you like. Look, your boss is probably not born again. They are not born again in Google. They are not born again in Microsoft. Their phones in your hand are not made by people who speak in tongues. Life at a level is more complex and at the same time simple than you can understand except you come into a different picture created by your God to really have helicopter view over everything happening in this life. And you can begin to manipulate it in line with the agenda of your kingdom. But if you don't have that helicopter view, you will be sincere, but sincerely in jail, sincerely poor, sincerely frustrated, sincerely raped, sincerely struggling, hustling, and doing so many things that represent the standard of society, not the standard of your kingdom. You see what I'm saying? A lot of times when you come to church to testify about cars, you are celebrating an escape. Because that car is not being celebrated in its design. It is that. It is, a, it is an emblem of superiority. So when you have a car, people believe you are better. You have left us, pretty much. So when you come here, you are not testifying that you have acquired a machine that has brought efficiency and effectiveness into your life. You are not celebrating the purpose of that thing. You know that this thing represents superiority to those who are observing you. So you have escaped and come out of those who don't have it. So the testimony most of the time is not celebrating God's goodness in providing you with an instrument for effectiveness and efficiency, but God's goodness that really separates you from everybody. So in other words, the sense of your testimony is not by the design of the machine or its purpose, it's by the strength of how many people don't have it. So it's the weakness of the people that defines the strength of that testimony. And on many levels, when you look at the curriculum of the gospel that most people understand, it is weakness, powerlessness, sensitive. In other words, if they don't find people who are weak or in need, the gospel cannot make sense. If you meet Bill Gates tomorrow, if you meet Elon Musk, the richest man in the world, or Jeff Bezos, 
How are you going to preach to them? What are you going to say? This is your year. Or what are you going to say? You will make it. Or what are you going to say? You know? Think about it. It is in that moment you realize that, come on, there's something wrong with what you understand. Because this person is married, his children are behaving well, his marriage is fine, he doesn't need anything, he's not trusting God for the fruit of the womb, he doesn't need any money, he doesn't have any problem that you have. So how are you going to preach? I told somebody that if Bill Gates is coming into a church on Sunday morning and he has a device to hear the prayer points of everybody, to, he has a, assuming he has that device, and he's sitting to the prayer point, for a moment he will say, I must be God. Yeah. They must be praying to me because 99.9% .9 of what they are praying about, he can solve all of them without even knowing that he released anything out of his finances. You have to have a house by the time you are 40. You must be married by the time you are 30 or 35. Who said all these things? Who brought all these rules? I hear a woman of God was preaching one time. He said, once you are 40, you don't have a house of your own. You are this, you are that. I can understand that. By the time I checked her history, she's been poor for a long time before she became found. So at times, the residue of your history can be speaking in the strength of your future. Except you really curate your freedom intentionally. Wow. And so I see all of these things, people speaking from their pain, speaking from their history of disappointment. Mm -hmm. They are now free, but they are crying free men mm -hmm. because they are not working in the full essence of the freedom that they have been given. Mm -hmm. And so they try to make a promise based on God's character, but they still speak from the deposit of pain they have known in their past. Mm -hmm. So by the time they combine it together, they give you a version of the gospel that looks like the truth, but is filled with hope that cannot perform. And so you begin to practice and try to win. And, and God works with people like that. We see that is the awesome thing about God. He meets you at the level of your ignorance. And I'll give you an example. If a ministry in America wants to give gas to a village in Kano or even to a city in Lagos like VI, in the United States, they don't use cylinders. I live there. They don't use cylinders. And even people that have traveled in this room, you've gone to America so many times, you may not know that they don't use cylinders because you've never checked. You just go and assume anybody just use cylinder. But no, cylinder is a primitive technology. It's outdated. In the United States and in most first world countries, the gas is already passed through the ground and so when you are, you can't build your houses anywhere. So when you are building, they just take it into your house. And then that's how you have the supply. There's nothing like go and buy gas, you know, carry the cylinder, as it finishes, you see you have more. Which is, which is essentially time, energy, and resources. You are going to spend time to be checking whether it is finished or it is more. You are going to spend money to buy that cylinder. You are going to just find to go and carry it, to go and put it. And when you are very rich in Nigeria, like a billionaire, you won't do it yourself, but you have to pay somebody to be doing it. The poorest person in America doesn't have that problem. The poorest person. It saves that time. Now, you can use it to go and do more stupid things, but it saves that time. It doesn't spend time checking the cylinder or not checking the cylinder. It doesn't spend time trying to check the cylinder. Have they bought it? Can we go and carry it? There's no cylinder. The richest man in Nigeria must use cylinder. Because of the infrastructure. It's subjects. So your light can still force you to a level of darkness because the infrastructure of your environment cannot allow you to experience that light. Though you know the light. So though I know that we don't need cylinders in America. I don't use it in my house. But once I come to Nigeria, no matter my level of comfort, I am subject to that infrastructure. I know there is a higher resolution available, but I cannot walk in it because my environment and its infrastructure limits me. That's not just it. That's for somebody who is successful. Now, for somebody who is now not successful, who has prayed God to give him gas. Lord, I need gas. And he didn't pray to Shongo. He didn't pray to Amadiora. He didn't pray to Arumila. He didn't pray to any other God. He prayed to Jesus. And Jesus showed up with cylinder. And he received the cylinder. He will now define that cylinder as the way God supplies gas. 
That's not how God supplies gas. That's how he supplies it based on the infrastructure of your own environment. There are higher resolutions to how God supplies gas that your infrastructure cannot undo. Now, by the time he has to endure, he wants to give you the type of gas system that he has. But he is sadly limited by your infrastructure. Even though he wants to give you all that he has, he is forced to downgrade to your level of infrastructure to supply you at the level of your infrastructure. The problem is you now receive that cylinder and now convert your own experience as a standard and doctrine for those in your environment. You now begin to teach the people in your environment this is how to experience gas. Because that is how you sincerely experienced it. Now, the experience you are having, therefore, is not enough to capture the experience available in the king of the world. So you find that you are not supposed to drive your life by the peculiarity of experiences. Principles are universal. Experiences are peculiar. The problem of teachers is they are not able to find principle in their experiences. So they teach principle as doctrine. Sorry. They teach personal experiences as doctrine and as standards. When the Red Sea parted, the Red Sea parting is not a miracle. Every miracle has two elements. The drama of the miracle and the principle in the miracle. But because drama is always loud and, and spectacular, more visible, it's easier to connect with the drama and the tragedy is miss the principle. So when the Red Sea parted, the Red Sea parting is the drama. The principle is that a people moved from a point of impossibility to a point of possibility. That's the principle. Now, for that to happen in Bible days, Red Sea had to part. That miracle is still happening now. But it doesn't happen with Red Sea parting. Because Red Sea parting is low resolution. It's primitive, slow, impractical for people who are living in the 2020s. Every time your plane takes off from Lagos to London, you literally cross the Red Sea. For real. I mean, if you actually look down, you will see yourself crossing the Red Sea. Faster, cheaper, more efficient. But you don't need to go and, you know, enter, you know, and go through all of that drama. Now, you don't even thank God for that when it happens. Because it is without drama. And so when we say we love God, we appreciate him, we celebrate him, we must find drama. That's why you see people pray, shouting, screaming, like... Like, and it's not wrong. That's the way you, you express your faith. I lay hands on somebody who was falling down. I watched him closely. The way he was falling down. Later I called him. I said, I said, you know, you didn't fall down. You know, you didn't fall under the anointing. You fell by skill. I said, what do you mean, sir? I said, I saw you. When I lay my, the way you were going down before, the, the speaker was behind you. Your head was going to be scattered. I was worried for you. I now saw that you, you checked it. In less than one minute, you now checked it, quickly edited the process, and moved yourself like this. Then when you were landing, you used your shoulder, you landed. I said, so, you didn't fall down. That's a whole production. You didn't fall down. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Now, let's be clear. If I lay hands on you and you fall that way, it's not wrong. That is how you express your faith in that moment to receive. There's nothing wrong with it. But don't now make me to subject to the way you chose to, exp to express your faith. So if you choose to fall down, it's fine. I must not judge you. Let him that fall not judge him who does not fall. <laughs> And let him who does not fall, not judge him who fall. The only problem is because you fell, you want to judge me because I refuse to fall. 
There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with me. I will receive whatever you have received. I laid hands on some guy. I had a prophecy for him. As I was speaking to him, he had fallen down. He fell down. Before he stood up, prophecy was done. There were some people on the queue. I couldn't even remember the prophecy again. I laid hands on the other person. That one started screaming. I'm like, what's wrong with these guys? And then I had a, I had a word for him. Was, she was already jumping all over the place. As he was running, I was distracted. The thing left my mind. I moved to the next person. By that time, I told him, don't fall. <laughs> I'm telling you a true life story. I said, don't fall. I want to tell you something. When I finish telling you, you can do whatever you want, but stay here. Hello? Otherwise, I'm just going to fall and stand up the way you came. This world is more important than this falling. So I said, don't fall. Stay. So I gave him the word and he received it in Jesus' name and he went to his seat. All those falling can happen. Some people actually fall without knowing. But most people don't fall without knowing. And I'm not, and it's not even wrong. Are we clear? It's not even wrong. You know, there are times where somebody is speaking a word, you just want to shout. That is your faith. That is the intensity of your faith. It's okay, but don't recommend it for anybody. That's you. Somebody else is karma in that moment. It's also not superior to you. Neither is he inferior to you. You are both at different frequency receiving from the energy of the Most High. Receiving all that is possible in him in that moment. You don't need auditory strength to communicate authority. You don't need. You can fire somebody by, you see, it's bad enough you are losing a staff. You now want to lose yourself in the process. You are fired! Get that. It's unnecessary. You see, you don't understand. You are just stressing. It's, it's double jeopardy. You already have a loss of a staff. Now you are going to lose your own mind now. You calm down. You can even smile to tell him. You can say you are fired. You can say it. It doesn't matter. He's fired still. Authority has gone forth. When security comes, letter comes, because there are people waiting on the wings for your authority. It doesn't matter if you say, you are fired. They will act. If you say, you are fired. They will still act. They are waiting for your authority. Now, let him who screams not judge him who does not scream. And let not him who does not scream judge him who screams. For God has accepted both of them. Yes, sir. Whether you eat or you don't eat, whether you, you, God has accepted both of them. Are we on the same page? Yes, sir. You don't need to shout the name of Jesus five million times. And if you do it, it's fine. Just also accept two, one of two things. One, that's how you want to express your faith. Or two, you really don't know the power of the name. Because if you understand the name, in Jesus' name, it's, oh, look, it's not you. You shall decree a thing. The Bible did not say you shall decree a thing and you shall establish it. You shall decree a thing and it shall be established. Somebody brought, somebody was HIV positive to us in, in, in 1999. And my sister at the time said, ah, uh, you know, Pastor, so we should pray for him. I said, bring him to the vigil where we had workers meeting. Workers meeting, not prayer meeting. So at the end of the workers meeting, I said, I will pray for him. By the time we finished the workers meeting, I had forgotten we have shared the grace. So the P, my PA came and said, sir, we, we have not prayed for him. Ah, I said, okay, that's fine. But take him to the hospital, to the, go and do tests, all the same. I believe he's healed. He said, but we have not prayed for him. I said, it's not my, did, did, he, did you see he lie in my name? <laughs> What's your problem? In his presence, there's fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore. Our own is to apply our first, he's healed. Say, hey, but with, I, I, you want to keep your job or what do you want to do? Take this guy to the hospital and go check him out. Three times it was HIV free. Hallelujah. We didn't lay hands on him. Now he knows the story. He's alive today in Dallas. He spoke at my last conference. Wow. 
free of HIV forever. Hallelujah. No laying of hands. Look, let's be clear. Laying of hands is important, too. Yeah. Very important, but it's not a prerequisite. Yeah. That's the problem. It doesn't have to be that way. But we must lay hands. And if you are laying hands, we are in order. But it's not that until maybe they couldn't lay hands on you, now you are not going home. Ah, you know, they didn't lay hands on me. He has laid hands on you. There's no distance in the realm of the spirit. Hallelujah. How many people? We are human beings. How many people will pastor see? Pastor can try. Well, try, try. You won't, if you take more time, you will judge him. You will say time is going, pastor. He so can't lay on everybody. Come on now. And there will be days you can dedicate the whole service to anointing service. We lay hands on everybody. Those days will come, but those days will not be every day. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. At the end of the day, it comes down to that grace and power that is at work inside of you. Is able to do exceedingly abundantly above whatever you can think or imagine according to the power that is at work inside of you. Not what is coming from outside inside, inside of you. I'm not talking to you. Ah, they've increased it. I will keep this one. They've increased the time, so I'll keep it this time. Are we together? So part of the thinking is to know that you can't subject yourself to the elements of life. You are bigger than it. And this world will put you under pressure. Say you are 45, you are not yet married. You've been married for 15 years, you don't have a child. If having a child is the meaning of life, everybody with children should be happy, at peace, and wealthy. Go to Mushi, even not by here. If you pay attention, you see parents cursing their children. You see children cursing their parents. Both of them regretting that they are around. The child hates that he was born. The mother hates that he gave back to the child. So you see that, ah, so it's not by having children. No. It's by my spirit, said the Lord. Not by children. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Not the joy of marriage. Not the joy of a car. Not the joy of a shoe. Not the joy of a big house. Not the joy of a landed property. These are human ideas. What we complete you has nothing to do with that. You are complete in him. Who is the head of all principalities and powers? There's no bank account that can complete you. There's no woman or man in this world that will marry you and complete you. Nobody can do it. No friend can do it. No business can hire you and complete you. No profit in this world can complete you. You are only complete in him. Who is the head of all principalities and powers? Am I talking to you? Yes, sir. You have to free yourself from all these things. You don't have a degree, so... People have become billionaires in this world without degree. You know, my mother did not send me to school, so I don't speak good English. Bishop Edebo doesn't speak the best English. He says poverty. It's not P-U, it's P-O. <laughs> it's P-O, it's poverty. But who do you want to be? The English teacher who says poverty. Or Bishop who says poverty. Who do you want to be? Okay. Go and be English teacher. You pronounce the English, I, I, I hold the body, so I don't know what you want. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to free yourself from the pressures of this life. Unto freedom you have been called. I'm not asking you to do what is strange. It is what you have been called into. Who bewitched you again and wants to put you back in the bondage that you have been freed from? That, that why a Christian is the reason why you should be boundless, Hallelujah. borderless. He cares. All your pain, all your burden. He said, bring everything to me. My burden is easy. My yoke is light. I'll take care of you. So look at the best of the air. They don't spin. They don't have business cards. They don't have podcasts. They don't do proposals. They don't have a sales team. They don't have websites. Your heavenly father takes care of them. So look at the lilies of the field. They don't write business pitches. They don't talk to investors. They don't have bank accounts. They don't have complimentary cards. They don't have a logo. But they are taken care of. 
Then he said, how much more? That means whatever it is that makes it automatically easy for the birds and the fish and the plants to be who they are and have complete supply, whatever it is that makes it so for them, it is easier for you. That's why he said, how much more? If it can be this easy for this guy, how much more you? So your humanity should not sentence you into hustle. To sentence you into ease. When you are hustling, you're, there's something wrong in your humanity. You are not functioning according to design. Am I talking to you? The first person that certified people, who certified him? Hmm? Say you become a life coach, or you now become, we give you a certificate, you now become, okay, the first person that gives certificates. Who gave him certificates? Hello? Where did he get it from? I'm asking you, please. He said, you are now going to have certificates. If you don't have this certificate, you are not complete. Okay, we hear you. Good afternoon, sir, please. Where did you get your own? You are the first person giving us a certificate. We agree. We are ready to follow you. We just want to understand where, where, where is your own certificate? Oh, your own came from zero. So zero is not nothing. The world was created from zero. Hmm? From nothing to something. That is the realm of revelation. It's vertical thinking. Zero to one. There's one to infinity, which is the energy of improvement. Which is what every other thing tries to do. The world was not improved. It was created. Hmm? It, it was created from nothing. One to infinity is that somebody must create something for you to be able to create anything. That's one to infinity. is lower resolution. The highest resolution is zero to one. Zero to one. There's nothing on ground. There's no precedent. There's no antecedent. There's no structure. There's nothing on ground. The Bible said the earth was without form and void. And everything was created out of that emptiness, seeming emptiness. In the same way that your phone right now does not connect. You don't, do you see wire between your two phones? The person talking to you in London, is his phone, there's a wire between his phone and your own. Do you see any fire coming between the two phones? You see nothing, but you're talking to the person. In Japan, and you are in Lagos, and you're talking to each other, that's a miracle. I hope you know that's a miracle. Somebody was going to Abuja, I was praying, Lord, keep the plane, you know, Support the pilot, help the wings, will not crash. Okay, it's fine, it's your faith. I understand. Because there's nothing that is not understandable. Foolishness is a human right. I'm telling you, 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 you can't be arguing, somebody must be foolish for wisdom to continue to have value. If everybody can be wise, wisdom will be useless. Is the rarity of a thing that creates its value. Yeah. If somebody tells me now, PK, you are stupid. Look, it's arrogance to say I'm not stupid. You may be stupid. If an adult says you are stupid, you must assume that he has a way of measuring stupidity. It's a full-blown adult that can go to jail if he commits a crime. You don't understand. You must respect adults because... The real power of adults is that they can go to jail. A 17-year-old cannot go to jail. Yes. I was talking to some young people, they were jumping. I said, none of you can go to jail. You are stressing your mom. If your mom go and ask her, she's going to jail. As a 17-year-old, we can't even call you a criminal. It is a crime to call you a criminal. They say you are at conflict with the law. They can't call you a criminal because you are a minor. If I slap you now at 50 something and I slap a 17 year old, it is abuse. Yeah. They say, I'm slapping a minor. If I wait one more year and slap him again, it's two fighting. Yes. 
It doesn't matter whether I'm 54 or he's 18. If both of us commit the same crime and I'm 82 and he's 18, they don't give him a better pillow because he's young. They give us the same pillow, we'll be in the same room, the same uniform. Because once you are 18, you are supposed to be ready for any level of responsibility, including a jail term. So when I hear parents say, my daughter is not ready to date, she can't start a job, my son cannot start internship, she can't, I, what do you mean? But well, you can go to jail. <laughs> Once he's 18, the social justice system says he can go to jail. You are saying he's not ready to get a job. So when parents say, my son is not ready, I understand. What they are saying is that they have failed in their responsibility to get the child ready for society by age 18. Because once you are 18, you are equal to a 60-year-old. You are equal to a 70-year-old. Forget about the birth certificate. Go, you go to the bank tomorrow with your birth certificate. Take your dad's own and your mommy's own to the, to the bank and say, please, can we have $10,000? Look, the, your jail see, you won't see that kind of aggression before in arrest. When they will arrest you. You can't get any attention simply because you came before us. If this brain is not communicating something else, eh, your best advocate is useless, as you know. That's why you have 18-year-old billionaire, 62-year-old security guard, there's no guy, I came here before us. It's like the grave. There's no seniority there. Guys, I came here since last week. In the grave. There's no, ah, no, what, what's your own coffee? Your coffee is wood. My own is gold. There's nothing. In the grave. <laughs> Equality of the highest order. It's the most humbling institution in the world. The grave. Everybody is the same thing there. You don't understand. There are about eight things that have equality. Mortuary. Death. Hello? Yes, so, the idea is, what is right, though? Somebody said, let sleeping dog lie. Not by your side. Because you don't know what the dog is dreaming about. <laughs> and your leg is the closest bone to the dog, and you say, let sleeping dog lie. What if it goes for your leg? So you can't let any dog lie anywhere. You want to lie, I don't have a problem. Lie there. I'm slain so that I don't suffer for your madness. Do you understand? So when the going gets tough, the tough sit, yeah, kids go, to where? Please, where is he going? If he knows his way, why are things tough? He just can't keep going. That is assuming he knows where he's going. If he knew where he was going, why are things tough? So when the going gets tough, the tough cannot just keep going. He will miss his way. When the going gets tough, the tough seeks collaboration. Collaboration. Woe to him that is alone. The cord of three cannot be easily broken. Two are better than one. In much of counseling, there is there's no hope for a low ranger. Yeah. You have to partner. Are you following me? Yes, so, the idea is there are no rules anywhere. If you pay attention to the thinking of your maker and you attempt to function in his likeness, representing his image, you will back newness, fresh way. Look, there was a time in this Christian work where there was no first service and second service. All we had was overflow. Pastor used to try to buy the other building and buy the other building so that they can spread more tents, spread more tents. Somebody came one day and said, that is horizontal expansion. We can expand vertically too. You see, how do we do that? On the same spot. That's our first service, second service, third service on the layer, fourth service. And everything changed. And then somebody came one day and said, we can even do satellite campuses. Somebody came and said, look, we can even do first service in first stack. And second service, good to see you, Piro. And second service in, 
on the island. Like Pastor Kodju, like yes. Pastor Kingsley Okonko. Yes. You don't know how innovative those things are. Uh, they look normal, but you see, in our own generation, we saw all of them happen. Do you get what I'm saying? There is nothing you cannot take back to where it started and disrupt it from there. Everything you call disruption, invention, innovation, is actually the art of taking things back to where they started and giving it a new journey. Are you here? So nobody, there is no standard to keep. God is your standard. Stop putting yourself under pressure. Somebody said you have to make this money, you must have this. You, all of us cannot be billionaires. Say, ah, we have to marry. So why didn't Jesus marry? He said, in times past, he spoke to us through the prophets, the fathers, in so many times. He said now, he speaks to us through his son. Jesus is your perfect theology. Whatever is not in him is not a prerequisite. If you didn't get married, marriage is not that critical. Marriage is overrated. Listen, marriage is overrated. It can never complete your life. You will soon see. Singles, you will see. All these things doing you, you are, you are going to calm down. Except you understand the kind of things we are teaching you now. So that marriage can be sweet. Because bread knife is a bread knife. It's supposed to be cutting bread. If they put it in your tumor, it will kill you. You will say, ah, no, you can't kill me. It's for bread. Now enter your tumor. Though it's for bread, it's bread knife, but it can cut intestine. So there's nothing good that cannot be evil. A gun can shoot antelope. It can shoot human beings. That's true. You can learn how to plan and plan to rob a bank. The same skill you need to rob a bank is the one you need to build it. Hello? Yes, Do you know it takes a lot of skills to be a successful arm robber? Yes. Project management, scenario planning. Yes. Ah. Yes. See, the highest level of scenario planning. Oh, yes. You are planning into a building you have not en even entered. And you are judging all this symmetry, all this, just by coming into the teller. You already manned the whole architecture. Man, that's genius. Say goal setting. You can't set a goal to, to, to raise somebody. It's goal setting. <laughs> because skills have their nuisance. Intelligence has its limit. Intelligence can destroy the world. Negativity can come from intelligence. But wisdom only lifts. So intelligence is not wisdom. An intelligent person can be a foolish person. But a wise person will always be right. Because wisdom only produces good. But intelligence can produce evil. I'm trying to shatter all of the things that we prioritize. If long life is the testimony, Jesus was an embarrassment. Because he died at 33. And it was a mistake. He came to die at 33. He was saying things that would make them kill him. Some people were just this thing on their own. He said, before your father Abraham was. We were at your naming ceremony. Are we, are we here? Is this man all right? We were at your naming ceremony. We prayed for you. We put sugar in your mouth. Now before, you didn't even say us. Our father Abraham, before he was what? Because he came to die. Seeing they must not see. Hearing they must not hear. If they see him in his way, they will preserve him. So he has to blind them and say things that will provoke them so that the commitment to invent the conspiracy to kill him can be shown. People were looking at a building on their own. They didn't disturb him. He came and said, if you pull it down, I will build it in three days. Ah! <laughs> you know how many years? In three days? And the Bible said, this is said, talking about the temple of his body. How will they know? How are they going to figure that out? They were not supposed to figure it out. They were supposed to be provoked. 
so that they can come and kill him. Hmm? That's a man that knows his assignment. Yes, sir. If you don't eat my body, you don't drink my blood, you have no party. Eh? Hey. You don't understand to say that to a Jew. Look at Peter, a man of God. These are not, these are dis distracted scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. Peter, tongues filled. God said, eat this thing. He told God that God said I should not eat it. You don't understand. God told him, eat, kill and eat. He told God that God said I should not eat. Can you see religion? <laughs> he was telling God what God said. Like, when I see people praying these days, they're praying hard. You know what they are doing? They are trying to give God new information. <laughs> I'll just be laughing. I say, really? <laughs> they are updating God. <laughs> I've seen prayer meetings for hours. Everything they are saying is trying to tell God what he doesn't know. Because once you know that he knows, the attitude is different. When you are doing you don't know that. It, he said, don't come to his presence to offer the sacrifice of fools. Because it's possible. It's possible. So what is it are you going to tell me, please? Whether it's having children or having a lot of money, billionaires have committed suicide. You need to calm down and ask God for his will in your life. He has made all things beautiful for you. He has set up everything. We stress when we move out of design. And the world will tell you everything, how to do it. Let me tell you, academics has a limit. The goal of academics is regulation, order, and standards. Two guys can put a knife in your tummy. One can wake you up one week after. The other one cannot wake you up. That's the difference between a surgeon and a killer. Now, if you need surgery, how do you know they want to go and see? Academics. It's what allows us to know a surgeon. From... There are two debaters. Both of them are hot in debates. One can save you in court. The other one is just that, debater. Now, you have a case. You don't want to go to jail. How do you know they want to go and see? Yes. Lawyer. It's academics that allow us to know that this one is just a debater. This one is a lawyer. He can save you in court. He has enough knowledge and skills to save you in court. It's academics that allow us to know that. Two people can carry a gun. One is a killer. The other one is a police officer. Now you need security. How do you know they want to go and see? You see what I'm saying? Academics. So, so now imagine that the whole of life will be complete. In that academic, it's a mistake. Oh. There's something higher. Academics provide regulation, standardization, eliminates mediocrity, eliminates quack. But it's not enough. Education is superior to it. Now, education is very personal. Even if you miss academics, you can be educated. What is education? The ability of the human spirit to do four things. Number one, to experience the world. Number two, to question that experience deep enough to find the options that exist in it and to know which of those options to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. I'll take it again. Education is the ability of the human spirit to experience his world, to question it deep enough to find the options that exist in it and to know which of these options to embrace as a matter of supreme urgency. To experience the world, to question what you are experiencing. The reason why the lion has not shaved is because he can't ask questions. If he can save question, he will shave. If he can save question, he will wear clothes. Animals are naked from day one to today. We were naked like animals too. The difference was that we could save question. So after a while, we started, we started creating things. They can't kill because they can't save question. They can't say why. Why must I have this? Why must I be here? They can't. Why must I have beards? They cannot do that. We can do that. It's the proof of your humanity, not your intelligence, that you are a human being 
you must have the capacity to question everything. Everything you are experiencing. Because there's always a bigger, larger, more potent experience parallel to the one you are having. And from your questioning, you bet options. Only human beings can bet options. Confusion is not a psychological state. When you are ignorant, you are not confused. When you are confused, you are not ignorant. In fact, ignorant people cannot be confused. Only knowledgeable people can be confused. Confusion is a refusal, inability, or unpreparedness to take a decision in the face of options. So when you are confused, you know what to do. You just know more than you know more than you should know. So you can't choose one. That's confusion. So a confused person knows what to do. He just cannot choose which one of the things he knows to do to settle into. That is education. And if you cannot do those four things, even with a PhD, you are not educated. You cannot experience your world. When you can experience it, you cannot question it. When you can question it, you cannot bet options from it. If you can bet options, you cannot decide which of those options to embrace as a matter of supreme importance and urgency. That is education. Superior to both education and academics is revelation. Now, you can miss academics. The world can rob you of education. But revelation is not your duty. It's God pouring it. Say this. The secret of the Lord is to those that reverence him. So all of that is God creating a type of world, locks you into a role in that, and so the information you need to zero into that is his job. So they said, we shall know the truth. And when they said it, they mean information. That's what people mean. That's why you will hear motivational speakers say stuff like, the truth that you know cannot set you free. Is the truth that you know, that you practice, that can set you free. In other words, they are casting as passion on what Jesus said. They are indicting what Jesus said. In fact, they are trying to suggest that Jesus did not think it through. When he said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Jesus did not say you shall know the truth, and the truth that you practice. See, the difference is, those who say you shall know the truth, and then the truth that you practice, are talking about information, data. Jesus wasn't talking about information or data. When Pilate asked Jesus, what is the truth? You know, Jesus did not answer. Because the question is wrong. What has reduced truth to information? The truth Jesus was talking about when he said, you shall know the truth, is not information, it's a person. He already said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm not one of I am the way. I am the truth. So the truth in that context is a personality. So when he said you shall know the truth and the truth has set you free, he said you shall know me. <laughs> the way you know me, I will set you free. If you can set yourself free, I am unnecessary. So you, <clears throat> you can't set yourself free. But when you know me, I will set you free. It's not information. You get what I'm trying to say? So in the next 10, 15 minutes, all we are going to do is know him and know what he has created real quick. And the key to transcending all of the machination of men, because men are going to try to confuse you. Let me tell you Africa's greatest problem. Africa's greatest problem was that the white man came here, took away our education, and gave us classroom. Because classroom is not the way we learn. We learn from observation and apprenticeship. We, our ancestors were not in class. Classroom is Western. And since then, we've been struggling to fit into the classroom. Because it's not who we are. Come on now. To learn in the class, classroom is a way of learning. It's not the only way to learn. It's the Western way of learning. There are many ways to learn. Come on now, I'm talking to you. I need to go. 
So, to beat all these things, the Bible says we know no man after the flesh. I tell people, if you need more than 15 minutes to know a fool, you are most likely a fool yourself. If you need more than 15 minutes to understand, to connect with destiny, you probably don't know it. You don't need two hours to know people. If you are in the spirit and you stand in that zone, you can shake somebody and know everything about them. You may not know the work they do, but you will know the ideology, the constituency they belong to. Somebody looked at me one day, our eyes met, and I know this is an evil man. This is a very bad person. He didn't talk to me. With the, our eyes just jammed, and I knew. Guess what? He knew that I knew. The way he looked at me after, he knew. Both of us knew what we saw there. Because all through that meaning, he was avoiding me all through. Because he knew I have the expo. And he knew I will take him where he doesn't want to go. He was avoiding me all through. Just eye contact. Just eye contact. Do you know if you know the God inside of you, you can walk into a room and people will be falling down. Demons will be screaming. You are not saying anything. You are just going. People can just be angry. They are just angry and they will leave the room. And you didn't do anything to them. You know, when I was much younger, as a, as a child of God, I used to think I must do something for people to be angry with me. But as I continued to mature, I realized that, no, you don't need to do anything. People can hate you for even doing everything right. You don't need to do anything wrong. I mean, look at Jesus. He came to cast out devils. They say he has devil. You don't understand? Somebody that is casting the devil out, human being said, he has the devil himself. Pastor, I'll take about six minutes, seven minutes, I'll, I'll be done. Don't forget, I'm not coming back next week. Are we okay? Can I, can I take like five, seven minutes more? So, so, how do you collapse all of these things into strength? Now, back into our scriptures. The only thing you need to do, go to John 17, 3, real quick. John 17, 3. Real quick, my brother. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life. This is it. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. That's eternal life. So, you can experience eternal life while you are here. Eternal life is not what you experience when you, de when you are dead. The Bible says, this is eternal life. Once you know him, the true God in his trinity, and Jesus will be a saint, you already are in eternal life. So you can be breathing alive here and be in eternal life. Come on now. You don't know what eternal life is. It's life unending. So you don't die. It's continuous existence. The moment you are in eternal life, let me tell you what you have done. Eternal life, people just think it's about heaven, avoiding hell. No. This is the life of God. When they say life, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's eternal life they are talking about. When you have eternal life, you collapse time. You are in yesterday, today, and tomorrow. At the same time, that's eternal life. It means your beginning is not clocked in Kronos. Your end is not clocked. When they say he has no genealogy, no beginning, and no end, it is eternal life we are talking about. That's eternal life is what Jesus died for, guys. Not shoe, not house, not car. Those are additions. What he died for is a capacity to function in the fullness of who he is, so that as he is, so you are here. As he is there, so, so you are here. So this eternal life has ended to do in your life. Go set him. No. You don't need goals. You don't need, you don't need a 10-year plan, 5-year plan. You have an eternal plan. L listen, you are planning 3 years. I said you have eternity. You know what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes? It said, he has set eternity in your heart. Go to, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 8, I think. Go there, let's go. We need to close this. A time to love, a time to hate, a time to war, blam, blam. Verse 9. Da, 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 da. Verse 10. 
He had, please, New King James. New King James. This thou, thou, thou. New, New King James. Good. He has seen, I have seen the God-given task which the sons of men have to be occupied. Verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. In its time. And he has put eternity in their hearts. In their hearts. So that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to the end. So when you join human beings who don't have eternity, who don't understand what we are talking about, that's hustling. They will be guessing, jumping up and down, trying to figure out everything. You can't put yourself in that economy. That's what you are saved from. You are now saved from guessing, from assuming. Assumption is the lowest level of knowledge. It's doing, it's guessing. You don't hope that you know. You should know that you know. That is what God does in your life. Is that certainty, that assurance that all is well. Everything, including your mistakes, are anticipated. All things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Your mistakes does not shock God. You understand? It doesn't shock God. It doesn't shock God, guys. You can't be praying for a plane going to Abuja, but when you are going to your toilet, you don't pray. Let me tell you the ignorance. The ignorance is that in your mind, you think the power of the devil to save, assuming he has power, you think the power of the devil to destroy is distance sensitive. And God's power to save is distance sensitive. Such that the further you are traveling, ah, you need God. The shorter the distance, <laughs> you are safe. Assuming you are the devil, think about it. You are the devil with limited capacity. You don't have enough demons. You have only a third. We know the number of demons. It's God that has innumerable company of angels. Devil has limited demons. God has innumerable. The same, you are not omnipresent. You are not omnipotent. When you are a positive, you can't be with me. Hello? Do you know when the devil is with you? He's not with me. Yeah. Yes. I hope you know. Yes. He's overrated in the world. He doesn't have all that attention. He can't have it. When he's dealing with you, he can't deal with me. And the same number of demons and devil that were dealing with Adam and Eve are the same ones dealing with 8 billion of us now. He's stressed, I'm telling you. He's, he's worn out. And as we are getting to the end, he's getting tired, he's getting weaker, he can't stand what is happening because he has an inelastic contribution, inelastic resource. He can't be new every morning. It is somebody with a capacity that is unlimited, innumerable company, that can be new every morning because he has more than is at stake. His messes are new every morning. Everything new every morning. The devil's one is getting older every morning. All these wires are getting older. We can predict him on many levels. Artificial intelligence can predict evil now. I'm telling you, we just don't know. If this, you know, when they were going to identify the devil in the book of Ezekiel, they didn't say this to They said, Who is, this is the man. They reduced, you know what They said, this is the man that has been tormenting the whole world. Man, that's what they called him. Because in the fullness of time, Eh? the devil will be such a very weak decima in the scheme of things. You won't, we won't, oh my God. You understand what I'm saying? The devil is so tired now, but he must be moving because he's incapable of repentance. You can't put him to shame. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like, you can't put the devil to shame. He's shame. You can't put him to any shame. He's incapable of repentance. If he tells you, kill yourself. You say no. Say, oh, fine. What about your mom? <laughs> the devil cannot say, kill yourself. You say no. Say, oh my God. No. The moment is capable of re remorse. That means it's capable of repentance. So it's incapable of remorse. He can't feel bad. So he can't repent. So there's nothing like you're putting him to shame. If he says, can you just kill yourself now? You say no. You say, okay, that's fine. What about your cousin? <laughs> you say no. You remember that your brother yesterday wasn't, can you kill him? He continues to negotiate because he doesn't even have time. 
Now, assuming you are the devil now, with limited resources, with all that you have said, stressed, you now have somebody to kill. You have all the power to kill him. Wouldn't you rather kill him on his bed than wait for 30,000 feet? You now want him to go and fly again to 45,000 feet? When you can just quickly kill that one, boom, and move to the next guy. Hello? You now wait. He's packing his bag. He, he wakes up. You can kill him on his bed. He refuses to kill him. He passes his bag. He carries his passport. He drives to the airport. You, are, you don't have time. I know the Bible actually says that the devil doesn't have time. He knows that his time is short. These are facts I'm giving you. I'm not giving you my head. So anybody that is limited by time is equal to man. Hey. That's true. That's true. Oh. That's true. The devil is so limited, you have no idea. I'm not limited by time. I'm beyond time. I'm never lazy. I'm never late. Let me show you what I posted today. Let me show you what I posted on Instagram. Somebody called me and said, I'm going mad with this post. Let me tell you what I posted. This is what God told me as I was preparing for pastor's message this morning. Oh my God. Let me show you. I need to show you this post. I said, I said, I have to read it because I learned from this myself after I finished posting. I said, when your maturity finally arrives and your freedom is complete, a critical part of what you will have totally accepted is the truth that continued existence is the ultimate possibility. Such that if our hope and meaning can only be found in this so-called count of the day of birth till the day of physical body dies, we are the most miserable of humans. We truly cannot cease to exist. I would say, deal with this. Plan for it. If the reason I don't have, it is the reason I don't have monthly or yearly goals, I function in what I call deep time. What I really have and manage is eternal plan. It transcends, it transcends all of the daily experiences of contemporary life. It keeps me in yesterday, today, and the future, all at the same time. Beyond time, always. Never late. Never early. Never on time. Never behind time. Never here. Never away from here. Woo! Never here. Never away from here. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is an indescribable gift that God has given us. In time out of time. Chronos cannot defeat your life. Nor define it. God doesn't pay salaries. Otherwise, it's in time. He doesn't pay wages. Otherwise, it's in time. Because it's out of time and you are out of time, it pays in due season. Due season may not be 3 o'clock. It can be 4 o'clock. It won't be monthly. It won't be every two weeks. Even if human beings refuse to pay you, the best they can do is salary clocked. Wages clocked. Due season out of clock. You can't be measured completely unlimited. Beat that, guys. Beat that. So you have to be able to rest in eternity. He said, this is the eternity. This is it. You know Jesus. You know God. You know the Holy Spirit. You already have it. It's inside of you. You are beyond time. There's nothing like, if I don't do it by four, I don't do it by five. How did you know that if you don't do it by five, it has finished? How did you know? You are thinking Kronos, not Kairos. Not that moment of visitation that is beyond time. So you, there's two o'clock. To God, two o'clock is two hours. To God, a day is like a thousand. A thousand is like a day. You can't clock him into any human idea. It's bigger than everything your logic can invent. And that includes you. You are bigger than me too. Are you here? In closing, understand these basic ideas in your God. This is how you must think. Somebody said, I want to be like God. I said, what do you want to be like? I want to be gentle. I want to be kind. I said, the fruit of spirit, the fruit of the spirit doesn't capture who God is. What about that? God is global. Is he in the nine? 
through the Spirit. Is it there? Let's talk. Is it there? The fruit of the Spirit captures a dimension in God. Particularly his character. There are things in God that are not in the fruit of the Spirit. Eternity is not on the fruit of the Spirit. I told somebody the other day, I'm not nice. He said, what do you mean? I said, I, I, go and read the fruit of the Spirit. There's, is, it, there's, there, is there niceness there? Hello? There's no nice. You see, God is limitless. You can't you can dimension him into anything. You dimension everything into him. Because everything only makes sense in him, not out of him. So I don't care what you have. What is outside of him is out of program, even when it's right. Do you understand what I'm saying? So they, let's go back there. The reason why people are depressed is because of time. If you take time out of the human consciousness, the human spirit can never be depressed. Depression is impossible for a soul that can't function in time. You can't be depressed. You can't be frustrated. Because your goals are permanently expanded and on a journey once you are out of time. There's nothing like it has to end next week. It has to end tomorrow. It doesn't end next week. It doesn't end next year. You are not judged by 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 40 years from now. You are judged in the whole of existence living inside of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, the Bible then said, Jeremiah, there are four dimensions to you. Don't believe the world and clock your life from birth certificate. Before birth certificate, you had two existences. Two identities preceded birth certificate. The day you were born is not the way you began. The day you came to the earth is not the day you began. Before you began, before you were born in your mother's womb, I knew you. There is pre-womb identity of you. Pre-womb. And in that pre-womb, there's commission. There's commission in the pre-womb, below. There's commission in the pre-womb. The womb cannot, they cannot define you. You preceded the womb. Hello? And the Bible said, guess what? To embarrass time. To embarrass time. He said, the one that lives a thousand years twice. Mm. Twice. And has no meaning. He said, a stillborn child is better than him. What an embarrassment of time. They just disgrace time right there. And say, what is it? Do you know, please, what is the oldest stillborn child? The oldest. Eh? No, 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 no. Think, 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 think. Come on. The oldest stillborn child is how old? Nine months. That was born dead. The oldest is nine months. So in other words, the Bible is saying nine months of existence is, can be better than 2,000 years of existence depending on whether you are purposeful or not. The opposite of life is not death. Because everybody will die. So it can't be the opposite. It can't be the consequence of not living well. Hello? So the opposite of life is not death. Because the wise and the fool will die. So that can't be the consequence. The opposite of life is purposelessness. That's the opposite of life. Am I correct? Yes, Think about it. Yes. It can't be death. The opposite of life is purposelessness. And the Bible is saying, if you live a thousand years twice, without purpose, even a stillborn child is better than you. Now, a couple I know personally were at war. They've been married about 11 years or so. They're going to kill you. Say, Fumi, is that you? Is that Fumi? Okay, you look so much like a lady called Fumi. So he said, truth, so, they were going to destroy the marriage. They were committed to ending the marriage now. They were already fighting, beating each other, all kinds of things. They could kill each other. Then they had one casual sex from nowhere, one of those pressure nights. <laughs> the, baby, the, the woman took him. And the miracle of that baby changed everything. Love came back to the relationship. Empathy came back. Kindness came back. They felt loving on each other. 
going out every day. Everything just changed. The software of the marriage changed. The operating system changed. All the assumptions changed. Everything was reinvented in that marriage. About the fifth or the seventh month, they lost the baby. Oh. Exactly. You see how you fell? The Bible says, the day of birth, the day of death is better than the day of death. The Bible says, better is he that is dead than he that is born. The Bible says, it is better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. So why are, what are we crying about? We cry about our sense, mm. our perception of what is happening. At every point in time, what is happening is different from what is going on. What is happening is what everybody can see. Oh. What is going on is the script and the design. Oh. Whether of men or of God, whether unto good or unto evil, there's always a script different from what is happening. What is happening was Jesus was being killed. What is going on was the world was being saved. Oh. Redemption. Ah. Mm? What was happening was that Job was being beaten down. What, was, what is going on is that the latter end of John was being curated Hi. to be better than its beginning. Hi. But what was happening was that it was in pain, yet what was going on is, is coming into eternal rest. Yes, sir. He said, had I known, we would not have crucified a lot of glory. Hmm? So the virus is called had I known. And it's always running as a virus in the character of the devil. God put it there. When he is killing, stealing, and destroying, he's achieving God's purpose. Hmm. Every time he has finished killing, God has finished. He finished Jesus. He put him on the cross. He called God and said, God, I've finished him. Who? Your son. I've killed him. So God said, you have finished, Abi. He said, yeah. He said, me too, I've finished. He said, no, what did you finish? You can't finish. I finished. You don't understand. I've finished. I have killed him. God said, yeah, I've also finished. Because every time you finish, I finish. You do all the dirty work. You do all the wrongs. You, you do all the stress. All the when you are done, I'm done. Don't you know that power dynamics dictate that the one who abuses the order of peace or equilibrium must be on ground to organize his restoration? Power dynamics dictate so. Who started slave trade? White man. Who ended it? White man. Who started colonialism? White man. Who ended it? White man. Who began appetite? White man. Who ended it? White man. Not Mandela, not ANC. They were already arrested, jailed. It's another thing that they cannot sell if black people don't buy. So by themselves, they went to jail to be negotiating with Mandela to cost the freedom to the bondage they created by themselves. You see this terrorism in the Middle East? Nobody can end it but the Middle East themselves. America cannot end it. Britain cannot end it. It's power dynamic. He that breached the order of peace must be on ground to organize his resolution. That's why the devil is not dead. That's why he can't be killed. Because if he's killed, who's going to kill Christ? Who's going to do the, who, who is dirty? The devil. Who's going to do the dirty job? Does God kill? No. Tempt? No. Attack? No. For God cannot be tempted by evil. Neither does he tempt anyone. So the devil is the one that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So he messed up everything, he will clean it up by himself. So what does God do? God will now put his own agenda in the character of the devil as a virus. And so when he is busy fulfilling his character, God is fulfilling his own mandate. The best the devil can create is all power what is happening. What God creates is what is going on. So I don't care what is happening in your life right now. Trust me. Something else is going on that he cannot see, that you are not seeing, but you need to know God sees. And he's working out a weightier form of glory bigger than whatever you think you are losing. When you mature in Christ Jesus, you will realize that profit and loss are the same. Come on. Compliment and criticism, they are the same. When you think they are different, you are still small. When you graduate, there's no difference between pain and loss. They are all the same. God will use all of them to architect your glory. Donkey. Donkey. He didn't speak to another donkey. He didn't speak to a prophet. They said he spoke to the madness of a prophet. Donkey. Locusts have gone on errands before. 
locusts. Donkey has delivered message. That's the God that you serve. Your pain is a messenger. You just don't know. Your pain is delivering message. Eh? If your hand is here, can you feel any pain? Because it's supposed to be here. If you put it here, will you feel pain? Not immediately. After a while. So a wrong move can be preceded by a season of bliss. It's a wrong move. Your hand should not be here. But you won't feel pain immediately. But if you keep it there long enough, you begin to feel pain. A lot of pain. If you don't bring it down, after a while, we have to cut this hand. Yes. Because every blood will flow out. So this pain, however, to bring it down, painkiller can't take it away. If you take painkillers, the best you can take is literally, you suffer relapse, the pain will be back. So this pain you are feeling is saying only one thing. Make adjustments. Have to bring that make back. adjustment. That's all this pain is saying. This pain is not your problem. Your misalignment is your problem. The pain is the symptom of the problem. So you don't complain about the pain. You, you seek the infrastructure that needs to be adjusted. Now, the moment you get it and your hand comes here, do you feel pain? No more pain. Yes. Yes. For a while. Also. So even when you return to position, you will still feel pain for a while because a residue of the pain you created here will follow you here. But if you stay true to this path, all the pain will disappear and On go. Whether it's marital pain, financial pain, physical pain, relationship pain, business pain, it's not your problem. Make adjustments. One more time, make adjustments. One more time, make adjustments. That is why clarity is superior to drama. When we know better, we do better. Yes. That's why you have the Holy Ghost. He will instruct you, teach you to make adjustments. adjustments. This is all you are making. The devil will force the pain. You make the adjustment. And every time the devil is done, he finished Job. Pa, 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 pa. When he was done, the Bible said the latter end of Job was far better than his beginning. Everything you don't like in your life right now, they are leading us to a better you. They are introducing you to a bigger you. What you need to do is stop complaining, start learning, start observing, start taking notes, pay attention. You are being moved from a point of weakness to your greatest strength. I don't care what it is. Did you get me? Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Pre-womb. Guess what happened to that baby? By the time they lost the baby in the fifth or seventh month, the child has already finished his assignment. The couples remained in love. They kept, it was too late. They were loving each other. They continued. About a year after, they got pregnant again and gave birth to a child. Maybe that child would be Billy Graham. I don't know. But that baby in their womb did not come to live for 100 years. He didn't come to live for seven years. He came to solve that marriage, and the timing he needs is six months or seven months in the womb. He didn't even need to come out. At the end of six months in the womb, his job was done. He has fulfilled destiny. The Bible says his destiny is better than the man who lived 2,000 years without purpose. We can't beg you to be born again. We can't beg you. You are purposeless. Oh, yes. You are running a program that when you, it's at the end of it, you're going to find out that it's, a, it's an incomplete life. Stillborn child had a higher purpose. So, that's the embarrassment of time. So, who told you you are late? Who told you you are too old? Who told you you are too early? Who told you you are too young? Who told you that you, your, your bones are sick? Hmm? I have a pain in my back because I abused my body in the last couple of days terribly. I didn't do my exercises. I was coming late. I wasn't sleeping well. My back rejected everything. And now I'm adjusting. I don't know how it works. The moment I get on this microphone, the pain disappears. It just disappears. That shouldn't be my default. I must learn to take care of my body. Yes. But this is the temple of God. I have to take care of it. But even when it's your fault, grace still fixes. Yes. 
he didn't say all things. Some things work together for your good. Or when you do the right things. All. Your fault, not your fault. The grace and his mercy. He said, come to, look. He said, come boldly. You know why? Because when you have messed up, you don't have the boldness to come. And he knows you won't come. So he said, look, I know where you are. But come. Come boldly to the throne of grace. To receive two things. In order, mercy first, so that you can come in. And grace to stand in it and operate in it. You are never limited. Do you see what I'm saying? Before you were formed, pre-womb, when you enter the womb, womb experience, four identities. Pre-womb, womb, post-womb. Now, post-womb is what you call life. That's what you call life. That's what you call your existence. Post-womb. That's what you call life. That's where you start counting from. That's where society counts from. Birth certificate. Where you came out. No. They are true before it. When we die, we get there, we see him as he is, or when we are raptured, you will understand the first truth. Now you are in the third level. This third level cannot be the definition of two levels that existed before it. And why you are in this third level, it doesn't define your end. There's something else in you that transcends the fourth, the fourth level. It's eternity. So, pre-womb, womb, post-womb, post-life is in you at the same time. My advice for you today is lean into it. Live from there. There's nothing like opportunity once lost can never be regained. That's time. Opportunity once lost can always be regained. Because opportunities live your life today, they go into your future to multiply. They actually can never come back in the way they went. Because who you are when they went is different from who you are when he came back. When he went, you were 21. By the time you were 32, you have changed. You have a wife. You have children. It can't come in that same format. It has to come bigger. That's why it's new every morning. So when he goes, he enters your future to multiply. Opportunity once lost can always be regained. It's coming back. And it's coming back bigger. You have not lost anything. You know what the Bible says? It says you will look back and find nothing missing. Nothing missing. That's the promise of heaven. Nothing. I spent 12 years in the university. 12 years studying a four-year course. 12 years. At the end of 12 years, let me tell you what should happen. If you have BSc, four years. Am I correct? Yes. Masters, two years. Am I correct? Yes. MBA, two years. Am I correct? Yes. PhD, maybe two years, maybe three years. You have still not used 12. At the end of 12, I had a third class. Don't feel bad, though. I live a first class life. Hmm? Fly first class anywhere. Hmm? Live in a beautiful house, married to a queen, have a beautiful family. Look, erase the poor from the dunghill and set them among nobles. Everything in your history is all. I've tasted everything from chewing gum to cocaine. Look at where we are. We used to talk and salivate without even knowing what was going on. I was in the body house at the age of three. People concluded I was going to fail, and they were right. They were so right. I knew they were right too. But God has a different script. Amen. Come on now. Amen. There's nothing in your history good enough, strong enough to define your future. Yes, Reject your history. It's a, at best a partial representation of what is ahead of you. Your name or surname, where you went to, the school you attended or don't attend, whether your name is Williams or Jamie Fuja, is irrelevant. Ah. What God is doing in your life is the most potent experience you can ever have. And finally, guys, finally, guys, four things you have to do to live fully in that. Number one, live fearless. You can't fear nothing. Nothing is strong enough. Practice fearlessness. Let me tell you how to do it. God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of love of power and of a sound mind. Record it. Audio. Faith comes by hearing. When they wrote that scripture, we didn't have audio. So the only way to hear is to speak. In 2003, we have audio. You can hear without speaking. Hello? Yes. Faith, did he say faith comes by hearing that you speak? 
Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. So, here is auto-suggestion. Look, my clients have healed diseases from this thing I'm giving you for free. People have paid thousands of dollars to get this technique. It's God-given. You know that thing that Jacob did? When he put animals in front of something and then they were giving back to spoiled animals? Eh? You know what that is? It's auto-suggestion. It's science. Hmm? You can keep the image. Your brain does not know the difference between lie and truth. Anything you suggest to your brain, it believes it and it sends it all over your body. You can give your brain direction by keeping the image you want to see. It's auto-suggestion. So when the Bible says you should do these things, it made your body. It knew why it's saying that to you. So, start telling yourself, I fear nothing. I have been bought with a price. I am not servants of men. I am made for all things. I know all things. I understand all things. I retreat before none. I advance towards anything. I am bold as a lion. I am, I am fearless. In the face of adversity, I have tranquility. Fear nothing. You are owing the whole world. It's not the end of life. As a 2007, I was a public figure. I was a pastor. I was owing the whole world. I made a mistake in business. Anything in uniform was looking for me. Police, EFCC, Boy Scout, Guest Brigade, last month, everything in uniform. They said my life was finished, man. They said you can never make it. Your name has been distributed. Look at you. Look at me. Hallelujah. Look at me. Listen. Every debt was paid. We beat it. I was in that crisis. He was working for me. I'm not lying. Am I lying? I, was, I couldn't pay salaries. I couldn't pay salaries, man. Everything was upside down. They said, look at him, man of integrity. Integrity is not what you have by avoiding crisis. Integrity is what you have when you stand in the crisis. That's integrity. I stood in that crisis. I watched God start it. He didn't go, no shortcuts. I went through the shame. They put their hands on my leg. They put their legs on my back. They called us name. They did everything because the situation must convince them that you are helpless. So that they can be convinced that God did it when he helps you. So you can't hide your season of obscurity. It must make them see it. So that when your life begins, they know something is at work in your life. They saw it. I prayed. Don't let them see it. They came to, I came to, I don't want to mention the pastor's name. His church used to be at Excellence Hotel. I was preaching there. Bank, you know, ah. when you are holding five million, or you are owing five million, you don't know. In 2007, if you are owing 360 million, in 2007, 360 million, you are owing. Really? Hmm. Really? When you are owing and, and bank marketers are calling you, you don't know. Yeah. When bank MD is calling you, yeah. ah, you hope. They came with marketer, police, all of them, to meet me on Sunday morning. On the, because they were tracking me with Ambil. Aye, wow. So I stopped taking speaking engagements. Because, that's, because they're going to track me. It was impossible to get out of that. But God got me out. And I wasn't going to run. I faced the most, most lethal adversaries of my life. Kids who couldn't look at us in the face were trying to give us counsel. You know, you have to do it this way. You have to do it as really? You? Really? You are giving me counsel? But guess what? I didn't say so. I listened to the counsel. No sense he was saying, but I listened to it. Because in that time, I don't have the local standing to brag. If I say, what are you saying? They will say, hey, you know better, you are in crisis. So I kept quiet. All of them have come back to either carry our bag or tell us to pray for them. Everything changed. Hmm? The sons of those who abuse you we come bowing at the source of your feet. It's not your goal, but it's what happens. It's not your goal. Fear nothing. Fear nothing. The Bible says, when you fear death, you will never fulfill destiny. So you will be in bondage all the days of your life. Science has now showed us that at the Thickness of any fear, any phobia in the world is the fear of death. At the root of any fear is the fear of death. Those afraid of heights, is, they don't want to yes, die. Yes. Those afraid of darkness, they don't want to die. Those afraid of human beings, any fear is traceable to the fear of death. So once you defeat the fear of death, you've conquered everything. And can I shock you? Can I? Yes, sir. You are not afraid of death. It's not the event of death you are afraid of. It's what happens after. 
today take instruction. If we announce now that from the today or from the beginning of time to die means that you get you arrive in any country of your choice with your passport, with your face and your name. Assuming that's the meaning of death from the beginning of time. First of all, there will be no embassies, there will be no visa centers, there will be no consular officers. Am I correct? Yes. Number two, if there is a house of death, the queue will be from here to Japan. Somebody will even go there and say, um, sorry, excuse me, are you the killer? They say, yes. My brother was here yesterday. I learned to use one knife. He didn't die for almost four hours. Please, don't you have something like bomb? People will get creative in death. Because now, when they die, they, are, they land in America with American passport to their name and to their face. So it's not the events we are afraid of. It's what happens after. When we were sure it was America, we were ready to die. Because we are not ready to die, because we are not sure heaven is there. And if you are not sure of the environment, you are not sure of the owner. We are not sure God is there. If you are sure, like Paul, who saw the third heaven and came back, he was ready to you will say, to live is Christ, yeah, to yeah, die is gain. No wonder he achieved all that he achieved. The most effective of all the apostles. Because at the core of that expression, there was no fear of death. They said, whoever has this and has this is going to, to, to Jerusalem to be beaten. He will be bound. He said, I'm not only ready to go to Jerusalem to be die. bound and to be beaten, I'm ready to go to Jerusalem to die. They beat him to a point they thought he was dead. When he woke up, you thought that people would be encouraging him. He was the one encouraging people who did not die. He said, don't worry, this is how I'm going to get there. This is how these things happen. We are okay. Because eternity is his clock. Do you understand what I'm saying? Number two. Number two. Learn to pray in the Spirit. Your walking, talking relationship with the Holy Spirit is the distinguishing factor. You see that zero to one I said? That zero to one is the zone of the Holy Ghost. That one to infinity is the zone of knowledge. That zero to one is the Holy Ghost zone. You carry him on your inside. The next level of the internet is in that zone. The next level of social media is in that zone. There are people in this room, you have some apps in your hand. Look, the next level of that app you are carrying is in the Holy Ghost that you are working with. He doesn't just do spiritual things like people think it is. Everything in this life is spiritual. Oh, yes. It will give you the cure to cancer. Yes. It will give you the next level of social media. We've thought we've seen Facebook, we saw Twitter, we saw Instagram. From nowhere, TikTok. There is a TikSpeak coming, and it's you. Tongue speaking, brother, launching the biggest app ever from Lagos, Nigeria, to all over the world. It can happen. It will happen in the name of Jesus. Amen. Your beginning is to believe it's going to happen to you. The next level of fashion is in this room. Genres of expression they've never seen together. Music we've never known. Somebody gave you jazz. Somebody gave you blues. Somebody gave you R&B. Somebody gave you Afro beats. There's one Afro conk. There's something in the world we'll be dancing to. It can come from you. Just when we thought we've seen the biggest idea, something new comes on the horizon. Yeah. Yes. The Holy Ghost is working with no name boys and girls, men and women who will stand in faith and in belief. Optimism is free. Enthusiasm costs nothing. Faith is zero dollar. You can express this thing. Imagination doesn't cost a dime. As underdogs, that's all you have. Start dreaming and God will finish it. You see what I'm saying? So, stay in that space and stay bold and confident. Pray in the spirit. Lebro Santarabo Shara pray. In in Genesis eleven, because they were trying to do what God did not say they should do. He said, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. They were trying to fill the heaven. He said, spread horizontally. They were spreading vertically. He said, Therefore, we confused their language. I don't have a problem with you coming to heaven, but it's not my plan now. Fill the earth is the plan. And if you refuse to fill the earth intentionally, I will force it into your reality. So confuse their language. Why trying to understand each other? They'll be busy spreading. So diversity of language was not given to us to bless us. It was given to us to limit us. That's why the countries with most language are the poorest. The countries with one language are very prosperous. The countries with two languages are even more, are more prosperous. The countries with 200 languages, they are, they are busy trying to understand each other. They can't create anything. Because God did not limit 
God did not give us diversity of language to bless us. He gave us diversity of language to limit two things, our imaginative potential and collaborative strength. That's what he limited with demonstrative language. Right? In the New Testament, everything in the Old is a shadow of the New. The New Testament is the completion of the Old. So what we lost in, the, in that moment at the Tower of Babel, we gained when God... What is the New Testament value for speaking in tongues? When you now speak in tongues, one language, one tongue. For he that speaketh in tongues speaketh not to man, but to God, for no one understand. How be it in the spirit, he speak mysteries. When you speak in tongues, you are back to that zone of collaborative strength and imaginative potential. That is the restoration for Genesis 11. So when you are speaking in tongues, you are not just speaking in tongues casually. You are back to that moment when they said nothing they imagine can be withheld from them. So when you are saying Nibro, Santaraba, Kiyama, Siya, Kiyaki, you are coming back to that power zone. Nothing you imagine in that zone by the Spirit will be withheld from you. Never enter a day without speaking in the Spirit. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. No wonder it was the most effective. Stay in the Spirit. If you don't speak in this room, you don't speak in tongues, see the pastors after. You should speak in tongues. Oh, yes. If you don't speak in tongues, will you go to heaven? Yes. yes will. will you miss on earth? Yes. Because you will not function at a level of clarity. That is what that does. Nibro Sakaba. When you get to a door for a meeting, you don't need to, you don't need it for four hours. Just say, push, Shaka, and go. Something follows you in. Yes. Just be aware you are communicating at a frequency that transcends the limits of logic. Oh, yes. For no one understands, albeit in the spirit, you speak mysteries. You speak directly to God. Get into that function. Yes. Number three, stay in the word. No matter what you do. I'm giving you basics of Christianity. This is it. There's no other science. There's no shortcut. This is it. Stay in the word. Matthew 22, 29. You are in error. Not knowing the scriptures, but the power of God. So error is traceable to inaccurate knowledge of scripture. He opposes all things by the word of his power. So the word is the strength in your life. When you read the Bible though, don't try to remember what you are reading. Just read, it's not textbook. The goal of Bible study is not recall. That's academics. The goal of Bible study is transformation. And it's not the work of intelligence, it's the work of heaven by the spirit. So when you are reading, don't try to remember, just read. One verse, two verse, five chapters, you don't do all these memory verses. Look, just stay in the word. It will look like you have forgotten everything you read. But in the day of need, in the day of contradiction, in the day of opposition, in the moments of conflict, it will rise out of you. And when it's rising, it may not rise as confession. It may rise as resolve. It may rise as anger. It may rise as words. It may rise as ideas. But it will rise out of you because the spirit of the Lord himself will raise that standard. But stay in the word. Stay in the word. Three chapters a day, five on Sunday. You finish it every year. Six chapters a day, ten on Sunday. Finish it every six months. Twelve a day, twenty on Sunday. Finish it every three months. I finished it, Genesis to Revelation, over 40 times. So please don't come and touch me. Don't ask for my handkerchief. That's not how we got there. If it's by touching an handkerchief, I should have touched somebody's baby and get a baby in one year. My baby came after nine years of marriage. I should have touched somebody's degree instead of waiting for 12 years. And I'm not saying you don't touch. But when you are done touching, please get into the word. When you are done talking and touching and jumping up and down, if you can't hear what it tells you to do, you are joking. For your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. So stay in God's word. If it's one verse, I don't care. Faithfulness in little brings more. Don't try to read the whole Bible. Just stay true to one verse. Before you know what is happening, you are comfortable with two verses. Three verses. One chapter. Two chapters. Before you know what is, you are finishing the Bible like water. I finished it over 40 times. That's why we are here. So get into it, guys. And start reading. Don't step into one day without doing these things. Confessing the weight of your fearlessness. Standing in the reality of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Staying in the order and the humility of the word. Even if it's a chapter, I don't care. Whether it's two minutes of speaking in tongues, I don't care. Just stay in it. It will grow by itself. And finally, dream. Dream. You are underdogs, man. Let me tell you what the Lord said. This is a prophecy. Everybody rise as I close. 
Take this word of God in. Take this word of God in. The future is now 30. I speak to you by the Spirit of God. Please, don't mind that I'm not falling down. Don't mind that I'm not, I'm not screaming. This is it. This is prophecy. Don't say because I'm not saying, I'm not jumping, I'm not saying, using one song. Receive in this moment. This is the word of the Lord. In 30 years, every human being I've created, living today, born of a woman, will be in one of the following places. Will be a full-blown adult. Will be at the departure lounge of life, ready to take the flight. Or they will have taken it. There's no soul I've created that will be out of those three today. If you are one, you'll be 31. If you are 10, you'll be 40, full-blown adult. If you are 20, you'll be 50, full-blown adult. If you are 30 now, you'll be 60, full-blown adult. If you are 40 now, you'll be 70, full-blown adult. If you are 25, you'll be 55, full-blown adult. If you are 60, you'll be dead. You will be at the departure lounge of life, already to take the flight, if you are not dead. But you'll be at the departure lounge. If you are 50 like me, you'll be 80 something. If I'm not dead, I will be almost ready to die. I shouldn't be 80 something and still be believing God. I should be saying I'm done. And now I await my crown. Hello? Listen to what God is telling you. Learn to number your days. There are dimensions of wisdom you cannot enter into if you treat your days casually. Aye. Teach us to number our days. Why? That we may apply our hearts to wisdom. So if we miss the numbering, we can't function in that wisdom. So calm down. Time is counting. That time is not chronos. It's the purpose of God in your life. It's time to take your purpose seriously. Every day of your life is speaking to your legacy. Legacy doesn't come mistakenly. It's curated. So stand in obedience and start trusting God for his value in your life. That thing is so pre-womb. That identity pre-womb is running in your life. You need to pause and ask God for grace to zero into it and neglect everything else. There will always be darkness around you. Stop praying against the darkness. The darkness is a constant. It will never go away. Light shines in darkness. Darkness cannot comprehend it. It doesn't mean darkness is not standing by it. Because I can't understand you does not mean I'm not standing by your side. So darkness is in this room right now. If you put up the light, darkness will not knock and take permission to come in. It's already in. When you take off the light, it shows up. It's there. Humble under light. Stay in the light. Just stay in the light. If everywhere is dark, ignore the darkness. If there's little light you can see, focus on that light. Darkness is a constant. It doesn't grow. Only light expands. Stay on that little light. That light will shine brighter and brighter and brighter. Occupies the whole room and humble darkness completely. So change your prayer points. Stop praying about what the devil can do or not do. Start focusing on what God is doing. We are knowing more about the devil than we are knowing more about God. God is doing so much more than the devil can ever think. Focus on that. This is what the Lord says, guys. By 20, 30, 31st December night. The Lord has been sharing this prophecy with me since 2018, December 31st night, 2017. When 2018, that's what the Lord says to me. By December 31st night, 2030. Four things will define the world. Number one, from now till that time, the fading of voices as we have known. The fading of voices and powers as we have known. Number two, the rise of powers and voices as we are yet to know. Number three, the rise of underdogs. No name boys and girls, men and women rising to new levels of prominence and influence in a way unprecedented. That's you. That's me. And the last one is the rise of the church in ways we have never seen. It's not going to happen by raising the dead. It's not going to happen by raising, opening the eyes of the blind. Mm -mm. 
All of those things I think Jesus has done. Jesus said, if you believe in me, the works that I do, you will do. But greater works than that, you will do. What are these greater works? Maybe you don't know is fine, but you know what they are not. What they are not is all that Jesus has done. What they are, Jesus did not do. You are the one that will do it. And give you the capacity to do it in him. We are going to see ideas in fintech unimaginable that will humble the whole global news media. And they will bring you on Time Magazine front cover. And they will ask you, how did you do it? Say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord on CNN is more powerful than 200 churches combined. Hmm? Jesus is Lord said in Time Magazine is more powerful than Jesus is Lord said in 5,000 churches combined. Your manifestation is culture driven. You'll be manifesting in the way the culture will be interpreting. Evangelism has changed color. We're not going to be impacting on the way we live, the way we love, the way we walk, the way we die, the way we work. We are going to live through ideas, products, and services. Write it down. We are going to conquer the mountains of the world through ideas, apps, computer, digital world, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, machine learning, big data. We are going to be frontliners in fashion, in music. We are going to be so queer, so odd, but achieving God's purpose. And guess what? When it starts, you'll be persecuted by your own people. So don't be distracted. Stay focused. Your own people we use religion and tradition to oppress you. You will reject it. Amen. Tradition is peer pressure from dead people. Yeah. You have to be wiser and stay alive for Christ. is coming. In visions, in dreams, you will come out of your house, a paper on the floor will speak to you. You will enter a cab, Uber, to sit down. The man will be playing a song. You will hear the voice of God in the song. It can even be a secular song. Once verse... God will pick it up, bam, and show you the next level of the internet. The next level of healthcare, bam. You read the newspaper about how somebody will be killed. Everybody is crying, and you are seeing the next level of how we die. We can bury people differently. We can create how a new mortuary in the air. You begin to see different things. Are you here? Yes, sir. How many of you believe God for that? Oh, yeah. Listen, don't take this moment casually. There is a download going on right now. And God is downloading into your spirit newness. Some of you are going into politics. You are going in there to define systems of government as we have never known. We thought we've seen the worst democracy. Uh, we've seen capitalism. There are new zims that God will download into your spirit. And they are coming. You will stand there. There are people in this room, you are business kings. You are captains of industry. In the next nine months, listen to me, God will do two things to you. He will clear your debts that you are owing. It will clear your debts that you are owing. And number two, it will open unprecedented doors for you. Listen, listen, listen. This is the instruction. When it starts happening, calm down. Don't just stop testifying. Once you see it, run to pastor and say, what's my instruction? The blessings of the next nine months are a means to an end. They are not the end. Your blessings in the next nine months is God telling you, I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you. And all the things you, you, you respect, let me humble them. He will use blessing to bring you to your knees. Not pain, not curse. You will not be sick. You will not die. You will not lose money. Your debts will be forgiven. More business will come. But when they start coming, it is God's voice saying, I need you. I have a plan for you. Rush to church for counseling. Listen, there are billionaires in this room. The next seven years is too much. It's a number of perfection, seven. Within the next one year, two years, you are going to begin to break into areas of business you cannot even believe in. There are CEOs in this room, chief business officers, senior managers that will find themselves in a boardroom as board members within the next two, three years. Listen, these things are coming to pass. There are students in this room. While you are still trying to pass, you'll be entering your millions. You are still trying to pass exam, you are entering your millions. You are still struggling with a cause and an idea is coming. Don't push it away. These are the times to be elastic. Your God is bigger than everything. Have you heard me today? Start dreaming. Whatever you dream though, remember, he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above whatever you can think or imagine. 
Somebody said, what if I think of a house in the air? Well, once you think it, God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above it. Your thinking is the limit of what God can do. So think freely. It's blank check. Imagine everything. See your fashion store in New York, in Paris. Yesterday we were talking. We invented a new way of experiencing fashion. You will wear it. You are going to wear it. We're not going to stop. There's grace available. Money that you are afraid of, investors are coming your way. They will come to ask for your pitch decks. Investors will, they will see you at a lobby of a hotel and they do something about you. What are you working on? What are you working on? So I'm working on this idea so I can invest in it. Money will come to everything you are thinking about. Amen. The first thing you think about is not money. Accept the idea. Start dreaming of the idea. Start the dreaming. Adulthood is a scam. It robs you of your sense of wonder. And you stop daydreaming. They tell you that's not adulthood. Stop daydreaming. They dream. See everything because they're already ahead of you. Today does not create the future. The future creates today. It is the things in your head that controls your thinking and your imagination and your, your actions where you are. So free your mind. It has started now. Welcome to a new world. Welcome to a new season. Welcome to new understanding. In the name of Jesus, I pray for you inside revelation. Your eyes are blessed because they see. Your ears are blessed because they hear. So you, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Ordinary will become extraordinary for you. You will connect moments more than ever before. You will feel energies in any room you come into. Your days of obscurity are over. You are coming into a new strength, new power, new influence, new understanding, new clarity in the name of Jesus. Now, this is for God's chamber. Man of God. You see, God has blessed you with vision. God has blessed you with understanding. Incredible insight that men will, will relish the rest of their life if they have half of it. And there are times when you've wondered where the highest manifestations of these things are coming to pass. And God is saying that in this season, I have chosen your captains. I have chosen your kings. He said, I've never been concerned about the oil in God's chamber. I've worked to raise your kings, and now they are ready. Kings who will not need one day of preaching to send money into the world. And he says, God's chamber will receive finance in ways you have never known. And that your hands will be helped. And that men are not going to walk arithmetically. They'll be walking exponentially. You will say one word, it will create billions. It will turn six years into six weeks. It will turn 20 years into 20 months. That within a very short time, by his own clock and by his own timing, your next strength will be to manage the kings of the universe. And that I have blessed you with wisdom to make them comfortable because they are coming. Some of them are not here yet. They are on their way. But they are in this axis. And God says, within this season, I will lift your work beyond the limits of this geography. Amen. That the world is waiting for your wisdom. And it shall come to pass in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now receive it for the church. Receive it for God's chamber. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And Madam, God asked me to tell you, there's insight and wisdom he has given you. You can't define it by anything normal. There's no logic in it. It's not just about ministry to men, ministry to women, ministry to girls. So I've given you unique insight and it's enterprise driven. I don't know what that means, but you will know. And that it will speak to you. It will come in areas you are sure you are not qualified for, but God will qualify you. And that you should be open in this season because he will send you people. Everybody coming to speak to you about work, about what you will do in this season, said don't greet what they are saying with acceptance. Don't greet it with doubt. Don't greet with opinion or view. Greet it with curiosity. Whatever they say, welcome all and bring it before me. I will receive it, say the Spirit of the Lord. And I will counsel you. And inside their ordinary statements, ministry will begin. In ways unimaginable, it will serve my kingdom, it will serve this house. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you praise, we give you glory. Can you all receive this in the name of Jesus? Just receive where you are, give God glory, worship him, exalt his holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are you okay? Yes, sir.
Are you fine? Yes, sir. I want to make one appeal, just one appeal. You don't have to forgive me, but please forgive Pastor for inviting a man that has come to wait, embarrass your time, consume your time, Thank you, sir. stress you unnecessarily. God knows how many minutes you have canceled. God knows how many Thank services, you, how many things you have canceled to remain here on this day. Who will have thought that by 1.30 we'll still be in church? This is 1.30, just in case you don't know. We are still here, right? I apologize for using your time. It's not God moving me. Hold on, hold on. I need to balance it well. It's not God moving me to use your time. I used it in the name of Jesus. It's not like any street, no. It's not that Holy Ghost was too heavy, no. I could have handed it one hour ago if I wanted. I could have handed it, but I felt I should continue. I would not even say I felt led. because I don't think it was about leading. I think I, I really wanted to share more. But in the abundance of what I've shared, the Holy Ghost will use this sea to locate you in your own angles. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I love you. God loves you more. Have a beautiful week. Have a beautiful week. I have a, I have a book here. My assistant just reminded me. This book is called A Love Affair with Failure. A Love Affair with Failure. Forwarded by Bishop T.D. Jakes. It's a great book. Published by Forbes. The first day we published this book, the day it came out, it was number one on all platforms in the United States. Amazon, Yahoo. It's a Wall Street Journal best-selling book. It's there. USA Today best-selling book. Barnes and Noble, everywhere. The book went boom. Changing lives. How many of you know you can never fail? How many of you know that the logic of failure is not possible? Yes, sir. Give me one minute more. Failure is not possible. Rich. Failure is a noun. A noun is the final identity of a person, place, or thing. So this is a watch. That should be a watch forever because it's a noun. This is a shoe. That should be a shoe forever. It's a noun. This is Ogba. It's Ogba forever. The content of Ogba can change, but Ogba geography will always be Ogba. Am I correct? Yes. A noun is the final name of a person, place, or thing. So if failure is possible, it means once you are a failure, you can't be anything else again. So if failure is possible, redemption should be impossible. Repentance should be impossible. Repay should be impossible. Restoration, anything re should be impossible. A killer should not become an apostle. An armed robber should not become a pastor. So, a failure is an impossible proposition. It can't pass the test of logic, how much more of spirit. So, failure is an impossibility. The opposite of success is not failure. The opposite of success is death. Because it is when you die that you stop trying. As long as you are living, your worst condition in error is failing, not failure. Failure is a noun. Failing is a verb. And so it's a journey. So your breath is proof there's something higher to conquer. As long as you are breathing, you cannot be a failure. You can be failing. And that means that you are on a journey. It's continuous tense. It means somewhere in your future, it can change to something else. And that is the assurance of your success. Do you hear me? Our stories are complete in this book. Myself and my partner, we told everything. We laid it bare. My crisis that I spoke about, all the money I was owing, I put everything here. And all the shame that I've known, I put them here. They will change your life. The book is very expensive. I'm not sorry. It's 20,000 bucks. You won't come with cash. So the church will help us receive it. Either you do transfer, you swap your card, and they take the money, you get the book. If you want me to autograph the book at the end of the service, I wait some extra minutes. Don't leave the service now. I came with only 15 copies or so. Oh, how many copies? Okay, we have some extra. Okay, we have some extra. So... If you have time, you want to pick it up, 20,000 bucks, God will bless you as you do so. Pastor, I want to thank you for inviting me. I do hope I've not completely embarrassed you and discouraged you. Whichever way, I love you, you know that I do. God bless you all. Have a beautiful time.